Well, any gardener can tell you that the worlds of science and wonder and all, all connect in our backyards. Right now, we're going to be talking with a brilliant young man, a biologist and a PBS host and producer, Joe Hansen. Welcome to Central Texas Gardener. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Well, and you, your biography is really intriguing. You host a bunch of programs produced by PBS Digital. That's right. Um, we're going to talk about those shows in just a little bit. But you, you're, you've brought the world of science to life for many, many people. You have hundreds of thousands of people out there following your work. Uh, you might believe even millions of okay. subscribers to, to our shows. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. But uh, I want to talk about how you got started on the path that you're on right now, of kind of being, I don't know, somebody who helps people connect with the world of science. Well, my love for science goes way back, mm -hmm. uh, as far as I can remember. I don't think there was ever a single moment, but uh, in our family, being outside, uh, being you know, being in my dad's garden, uh, I can't tell you how much eggplant I had to eat as a child, <laughs> thanks to him. Um, but also experiencing trips to parks and mm -hmm. experiencing firsthand hands-on nature, yeah. and also also through scouting, it was always a big part of my my childhood. Mm -hmm. um, that 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 planted this seed that ended up becoming uh, a, a, a career in biology earlier on in my right. life. I'm a you know I'm a biologist. Mm -hmm. I have a PhD in that field, and um, as part of that. Every scientist knows you got to do some teaching along the way. Of course. Yeah. And I fell in love with that. That that interaction and that reward of being mm -hmm. able to try to share a little bit of that excitement that got me into the field. Right. Um, it was a bug and that, that I that I've never quite gotten out of me. And I was able to to turn that into a, a couple of series for PBS, which has been incredibly rewarding. Well, setting people's imaginations on fire is what science really is great at. It's, it's really sad, though, that in our culture and times, a lot of people look down on science. You know, as, as if it's like some kind of ism that they have to be afraid of. You know, a lot of people are afraid of science. A few of them got that from from teachers. A few of them got that from some bad experiences in school. But a lot of it, I think, comes from this idea that science and all the things that it means is is far away it's mm -hmm. that it's that it's something separate mm -hmm. because we interact with you know plastic and metal and steel devices all, all day long and, right. and we forget about things like the living world often and, yeah, and we right. lack those interactions and, and it is something that everyone can and should experience well one of your most popular programs is it's okay to be smart, which is a great title, but it's kind of sad to me that you have to <laughs> apologize or come up. It's like it's okay. <laughs> it's definitely not an apology. <laughs> definitely not an apology. Um, it's a, it's a celebration of that idea. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a motto that celebrates curiosity. Because mm -hmm. anyone who knows me in real life will tell you that I walk through life wondering how things work and being obsessed with figuring out why things are the way they mm -hmm. are. And so on my show, uh, we look at big and small questions to try to uncover little answers about, about how the universe works and how yeah. we fit into it. And it, it is so exciting. I mean, I get excited and I just try to share that excitement yeah. with the people. Well, you know, I think that stereotype of science as this cold, clinical kind of activity and not as a portal of wonder and awe. You know, and there, there seems to be a fear of of, the, of that the clinical side, but people are missing all all the cool stuff in a way. You know, we keep teaching people that science is a bunch of things to remember instead of a <laughs> instead of a thing that people do. Yeah, you know, it's right. a verb to right. me. It's not. Yeah, it's right. not. It's not mm. the that. It's not that boring thing that people have had all mm. those horrible experiences with, and and that's yeah. what we share. And it's okay to be yeah. smart. Well, uh, and th this comes to life in another series you're working on, which is called I Hot know. Mess. Hot Mess. It deals with climate change appropriately. <laughs> yeah, you know, climate change is not the most fun thing to talk mm -hmm. about often. Uh, it can be a little bit depressing, a little bit intimidating and frightening, mm -hmm. but Hot Mess is a place where we're trying to turn to stories that, of optimism, of people who are trying to make change, uh, who are trying to share the science and are trying to create a better tomorrow mm -hmm. than, than, than the world that we live in mm -hmm. today. Well, we gardeners <clears throat> are keenly aware of science and climate change. Because we can see plants thriving now in Austin, for example, 
that 20 years ago would have died in any Austin winter. Mm -hmm. So we can see it. We, we see the, the change in the insects. We see the change in the plants. But let's talk about some of the other ways that science connects with the world of the garden. I don't know how people can look at a garden and not see science. Mm -hmm. I've never been able to do it. I, it's <laughs> always been there for me. I mean, mm -hmm. think of a plant as a living thing that turns gas into its body that eats light. And it, I mean, those are processes <laughs> of, of physics and, and, and the quantum realm that are, yeah. are mind blowing. And every garden is an ecosystem mm -hmm. with millions, maybe billions of different living things in, in, yeah, a, in, right. a, in a spoonful of soil. I mean, yeah, how exactly. people can not look at science in their garden is, is, is mind boggling to me. Yeah, you know, and the more you learn about gardening, the more mind boggling and wonderful wondrous it becomes it's it's you know it's I, I remember start when I started learning about soil biology and how the plants attract uh, the the critters they need in the soil by uh, producing sugars the critters then can consume the sugars and produce something the plant needs and this amazing web of relationship that's out there. It's just astonishing. It really is incredible. And you know, science is about uh, experimenting mm -hmm. and observing, mm -hmm. um, which is something every gardener knows and, sure. and, and does. And right. it's also about failure. And <laughs> certainly everybody <laughs> yeah. who gardens knows about that too. Right, right. So yeah, it's a trial and error for sure. Speaking of Charlie, let's talk about some myths out, uh, that are out there. That and I know you have some great anecdotes about this. So, so one of my favorite myths about mm. about gardening, about plants in general, mm. is uh, there's an idea that a lot of people have that the air that we breathe. I mean, what do we know about plants? Is that they mm. they take in carbon dioxide right. and they give off oxygen, mm -hmm. but the oxygen that we breathe doesn't come from carbon dioxide, and that's something that a lot of people uh, that's a misconception that they carry. Mm -hmm. The oxygen that we breathe actually comes from water, from a plant ripping apart water molecules inside of its of its body and giving that off to us, which. Next time you look at a plant, just have that thought, and I, I think you'll have and a really profound you. moment. <laughs> and say thank you. Yeah. Um, another another myth that, that I see, and these aren't as popular anymore, but we all, we're all worried about mosquitoes. Nobody likes to have mosquitoes around. No. Um, and <laughs> true. And mm -hmm. any device that zaps them, bug zappers and things mm -hmm. like that, uh, they use ultraviolet light to attract insects mm -hmm. uh, and the mosquitoes. Sure. But the problem is mosquitoes don't, follow ultraviolet light, That's, uh, they follow carbon dioxide to find their meals, which right. is what we breathe out. Right. You know, we're leaving this trail that they're, that they're, that they're homing <laughs> in on. Right. And, the, and the problem with control devices like that is that they kill everything but mosquitoes. Uh. Uh, all these things like bees and butterflies and other species that do use ultraviolet light to navigate their world. So there are much more effective ways to, to, to try to take care of, of insects like mosquitoes that are not bug zappers, okay. as fun as that sound is. <laughs> well, thank you for that. It makes me sad to think of all the uh, unwitting victims there and undeserved mm -hmm. victims, you know, as well. So you, you also, you travel the world and you've encountered many incredible things and I'd love for you to share some of the anecdotes of, about some of the stuff you explore and that you share as well in your work. I've been incredibly lucky to go to amazing places to explore science and uh, you know, in my own garden, one of the things that's obsessed me for a while is this is this idea of things copying other things. Yeah. Um, we we know famous stories like uh, the monarch butterfly is toxic to many of its predators, mm -hmm. and so there are many butterflies that want to look like a monarch butterfly. Mm -hmm. We were lucky to go to Peru into some of the most untouched rainforest on Earth, and at night you set up a big bright light and you see what flies in. We saw we saw moths that look like fireflies because fireflies carry toxic compounds in them. Uh, okay. These moths were red and black, even down to having shiny little spots on the side that give off little bursts of light when, they, when, when they're reflected on them. Just an mm. incredible disguise. We it, were walking around in the Peruvian rainforest one day, mm -hmm. turn the corner on an enormous tree and see this little orange fluffy caterpillar there that is a flannel moth, technically. Mm. They're, they're widespread throughout many parts of the Americas. Uh, but now it's got a nickname called the Donald Trump caterpillar because of its <laughs> orange fluffy hair. Once you see a picture of it, you'll understand completely. Um, it's a venomous caterpillar, all those little mm. hairs. Uh, and we were able, talking to research down there, researchers down there, to find a baby bird 
that mimics this oh caterpillar. Okay, this even cool. down to the wiggle. And it just shows you just <laughs> the, the incredible creativity of nature. Yeah, well, I can, I can sense here your creative uh, potential and creativity. And uh, it's such a pleasure to talk with you and to know that you're kind of a, one of our brothers here in PBS system. Thank you for doing the work that you do. Well, thank you for having me, and I uh, hope everybody keeps going outside, uh, looking up and looking down. Okay, and real quickly, where can people find you? They can find us uh, on YouTube, uh, It's Okay to Be Smart, okay. or Hot Mess. Okay, very good. Okay, well, thank you so much for being taking a little time to share with us. Thanks. All right, coming up next, it's Stephanie.